We pledge to say it like it really is. With dignity and respect. Committed to free speech and common sense. Upbeat and entertaining. Straight talking and direct. We may educate each other and you. Heartfelt and passionate. Thought-provoking, provocative and controversial. Fearless and truthful. Hello and welcome to The Pledge, the most unpredictable debate show on TV. So post-truth has been named Word of the Year by the Oxford Dictionaries. They define it as an adjective relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion that appeals to emotion and personal belief. Or, to translate, everything June Sarpong is about to say. <laughs> on today's programme, Afwa's drawing the line between free speech and hate speech. June's convinced that Americans will come round to her way of thinking. Graham says when it comes to the NHS, we should all play the game, but not in the way you'd think. And Michelle's arguing that Lord Farage is the man to save the special relationship. Sacre bleu! That ocean-going sense of arrogance and disdain for which those ghastly unelected Euro leaders are so well known, and for some so reviled, has been on display in all its Windjaramic glory in the aftermath of Donald Trump's electoral triumph. What arrant nonsense possessed them. They felt the need to call an emergency summit to deal with Trump trampling the opposition and credit to Boris Johnson and his French equivalent, who both opted to say they were too busy to attend. European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker even went so far as to say the EU needs to teach Trump what Europe is and how it works. This nation has far more affinity with the US than it has ever had with the EU. We speak the same language. Well, just about. And we haven't been at war with them twice in the last century. I know our Euro elite has a problem with democracy and member states are instructed to simply do it again if a public vote goes the wrong way. Remember Ireland? But just who do EU think you are kidding, Mr Juncker? <laughs> Find your worldview fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> right. Who did President elect Trump call before he called his special friends on this side of the Atlantic? I can answer that question. He called Egypt, Ireland, oh, yes, indeed, Mexico, yeah. Israel, <laughs> Turkey, India, Japan, <laughs> Australia, and South Korea before he called yep. the friends he values so much that we don't need to be part of the EU. We can just go in alone with our special relationship. <laughs> it's not true. Um, my, my concern, though, is I hear what you say about the list, and I think some of those calls had to be made, not least Mexico uh, and some of the others. Of course, there's a degree of tension between those two countries. We all know idea, why. Yeah, it was the idea of building, uh, building that wall. But what possesses the people who run Europe to think that... And I, I can't wait to hear June's view on all of this, by the way. But <laughs> the people, the great people of America have spoken. They have democratically elected the person who is now going to be, or is now president-elect. It just strikes me as absolutely extraordinary that these unelected Euro leaders need an emergency summit. What, what do they think? What do they think is going to happen? I know you can't answer this, but what on earth do you think they think is going to happen maybe, because Trump has been victorious? Well, maybe they think that somebody who described Belgium as a beautiful city <laughs> was one hundred percent clued up well, they all on European mistakes. relations. They all make on a more serious note, right? The EU, whether we're in it or not, was mm -hmm. built on certain ideals. Mm. After a war that caused mass destruction, genocide based on racism, it has shared values, it believes in free trade, right? It makes sense so to me. Trump. It makes sense to me that upon the election of a man who has openly and repeatedly spoken against those values, that European leaders should come together and discuss what their Question. response to be. And instead of our government, which has just pandered relentlessly to Trump, done the most powerful U-turns, witness what Boris Johnson said yeah. when, when Trump was calling London a yeah. no-go area, yeah. saying that it was ignorant, and now saying, well, we don't want to prejudge him, you know, he might be a great president well, after we all. say things we regret. Look, instead of <laughs> Angela Merkel... I, was, I, was <laughs> I, I liked his football. <laughs> <laughs> I know that was a mistake. But, I, I, mean, the, wish, the... I wish our government had the integrity of the German government to say, we will do business Did with you, Trump but, on the condition that he adheres but, question, to our fundamental I'm, I'm, values of freedom, tolerance, right. respect for people right. based Here on colour religion. Would you, would you stop interrupting me when I'm interrupting you, by the way? Yeah. Do you honestly think, had Hillary Clinton been victorious, you honestly think they'd have had a quick huddle in they Europe? Wouldn't have needed no. to. They wouldn't have needed to. They wouldn't have needed it's, to. Because can, can the, the, the not, answer went, the verdict went their way. Can That's you not see, shameful. Can you not see how, so from a European perspective, it's a crisis. It is a crisis. It's a crisis of collective security. It's a crisis of values. It's a crisis of trade. 
what responsible regional grouping would not want to have an emergency meeting in these circumstances? I mean, I can see June nodding, you know. I, I, I'm going to bring Michelle in a minute, but let's, come on, let, let's keep the case for the prosecution. Oh, I've got yeah. so much love for <laughs> <laughs> I want to know, did you write that intro yourself? Nick, yeah, Brian? I did, sure. Yeah, My yeah. goodness. You're, well, I mean... You take the boy out of the sun, don't you? <laughs> take the sun out of the, the, sun out of the boy, let me tell you. No matter how hard we try. <laughs> um, I, I agree with everything Afor just said, and the only thing I would add to that is, at the end of the day, with all of the disgusting, ghastly things that Donald Trump said during... Candidate his... Trump. Let's remember, people say a lot of President things. President-elect, yeah. whatever you want to call him. He's been rowing back on everything. Absolutely well, I don't everything. care. He still said them. So, therefore... Europe understands that Europe is now going to need to be the moral compass of the world because nobody's listening to America under President Trump. So, of course, they need to regroup and figure out the important role Jude, they're now going to have to how play. How you just write off the most powerful nation on Earth by saying no one um, is listening to the United States Under of President Trump, they're not. No, how do not... you know that? Well, we how know in know terms of how the rest happen? of the world has responded to him. But this is, to me, this is ridiculous. You're calling this a crisis that Trump's got in. You're no, saying I'm no one's going to listen. No, I'm calling it a disaster. No, you just said no <laughs> one would listen. You don't, he hasn't even, he hasn't even um, been inaugurated yet, and everyone's yeah, predicting how much of a crazy is crisis it's going to be. It's unreasonable to take Based on what he said. on what he said when <laughs> well, he was you know running what? the office. I don't think that's an unreasonable You are where you are. We are where we are. It's truth, isn't it? So we shouldn't take him at his word. You approach situations with optimism. It is what it is you get on with it i completely agree with you when it comes to the eu i think it's ridiculous i think number one it's just ridiculous that they were so shocked by the fact that he even got elected in the first place and that for me shows that there's a problem with them point one point two they can't even get themselves together to this crisis meeting you know you've got members just too busy washing the hair, not don't even want to turn up. Yeah, but quite, quite crucial members. No, one's leaving. Yeah, so but they, he doesn't need still, to be there anyway. We haven't they? left yet. It, yes, we're going to leave, but we're still a member. We're still a crucial member. We should have been there, and that, they can't even organise that meeting. And then when they come out and say like, we want to show him what the EU expects. If I was him, I'd be thinking, shut up. Like, who do you think you are? He'd probably say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the fact is, you know, there's optimism which is fine, but there's also, in times like this, realism, I think. Yeah. And, and ultimately, when you've got such um, comments that, that suggest that Europe is going to be a very different place, NATO, for, an ex for example, yeah. you know, and he's totally within his rights, and he might have an extremely good point, and his cabinet might, about the fact that... European countries need to invest more in, in, in NATO. This and is how America... NATO, America funds 70% of yeah. NATO. And exactly. Most countries exactly. in Europe and don't pay the 2% yeah. of the yeah. exactly. yeah. requirements. That might, be a valid, that might be a valid argument um, for, from well, a US a perspective. For, from a US perspective. Yeah, well, we've got to wait to see what, what the terms of that relationship are going to be going forwards. I don't have a problem with EU leaders getting together and, and foreign secretaries getting together. I think it was completely wrong that they stated that it was an emergency meeting and a panic and, and, and because that plays into this, this agenda that is about um, we don't like what we're seeing, we don't like the fact that he's been democratically elected and the response of the voters. The fact is, is that, that we're in a changing, a changing political world um, and that has a huge impact potentially on what Europe looks like in the next two to three years. There's a lot of elections. I yep. mean, a, a, an example of, of the changing landscape is Marie Le Pen, and we've, yep. got, we've got her on the Mar show here saying, what, uh, saying okay. what she said last week. Well, clearly, Donald Trump's victory is a, an additional stone in the building of a new world destined to replace the old one. Of course, with the Brexit vote, but also with the emergence of movements devoted to the nation, patriotic movements in Europe. All these elections are essentially referendums against the unfettered globalization that has been imposed upon us, that has been imposed upon people, and which today has clearly shown its limits. See, for me, the political sort of pendulum is swinging. Yeah. And, and again, you don't, I don't have any problem with that, but it's how far it goes. And if you've got extremism at either end of that, that is dangerous. Mm. And the fact for me is that it's an opportunity because I think if Clinton had got in, it would have been maintaining the status quo. Well, we've had extremism okay. on the other side, haven't we? We have. And, I'm, I'm... and even the Prime Minister said this week at the Lord Mayor's Banquet, liberalism now either needs a review or it is dead. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's about... The, the danger for me is about polarising people and at, at either end of that pendulum swing. Mm. And, and it's important, I think, that there is a, a, a European response. 
I, I, I'm quite offended that Boris Johnson and the French Foreign Minister didn't go to Why? that. Why? You're because offended I am, that. because because we're still part... France are obviously part of Europe, and we're still part of Europe. So being around that table to discuss it, I think, would serve as a as, as sort of a, a maintaining uh, the values that we... the shared values that we yeah. have. So, so you... what? I find that bizarre that you that you would find that offensive not to attend that meeting because it's that was job. but that was a crisis meeting. Everybody knew the date of the election. That date hadn't changed. Yeah. Everyone knew that. Well, apart from Donald Trump, he thought it was the 28th. <laughs> but most people <laughs> knew the date of the election. So if you want to have a meeting to discuss the outcome, you could have scheduled that in ages ago, and everyone could have made sure that their diaries worked for that. They they arranged it off the back of like a, a panic moment of Trump, and they but, for me were right to do that. Don't you think they should be panicking, Donald no. Trump? Let me finish. Donald Trump has made it very clear what his relationship with Russia is going to be. Russia has been an aggressor to the rest of the Europe and Russia in the past has had a very fraught relationship with America. So of course they should be calling an emergency meeting. This is dangerous. And I would agree with Greg. It's their job. It's I their mean, job. Michelle, you know, whatever you think of Trump, it is not business as usual, it's right? Not. And okay, people voted for that. People want it. We could go into the reasons. I mean, we have done. I'm sure we will again. But the reality is this is a seismic shift. You know, it's a game changer in global politics. And I think what responsible regional grouping wouldn't meet to discuss that? Okay, maybe calling it a crisis meeting or a disaster is not the most diplomatic way of labelling it, but the reality is the same. They need to meet to discuss their response. And I think that so what we're doing, relying on the special then? relationship, it's just deluded, you know. We need to get our stuff together. Well, if it's such a crisis and there's 28 people you're trying to get into a room, you would actually schedule something in advance to make sure that you've got all the key players around the table. You wouldn't just sit. And this, for me, is the problem. People are so shocked and they just write people like Donald Trump off. And this is why we're in the situation that we're in. It, 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 you should have had this meeting booked in such a long time ago. You can't just okay, okay. It was a scheduling it. error. Are you saying because <laughs> <laughs> it was a scheduling error the meeting no, should not happen? Not, like, that doesn't make any sense. The reason me. it wasn't booked in is reflective of the fact they that people okay, dismissed it. Achieved, <laughs> what is achieved by using language such as this, Jean-Claude Juncker? I think we will waste two years before Mr Trump tours the world he does not know. I mean, I that am but is he not language not of diplomacy. in the Juncker is. fan club, first of all. So I'm not going to defend what he said, but I still stand by... He's made it clear himself he doesn't know the world. OK, well, look, from one emergency meeting to perhaps not quite another, um, I understand, Graham Lasso, as a fellow pledger, that you're going to be pay playing a role in choosing the next England manager. They're putting oh, wow. a panel together. Um, what are you going to be looking for? Who's on the panel and what are you going to be looking for? Well, that's private information. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a shame you brought it up in public, actually, because I wanted to tell you personally, yeah. not on the public. I've got the no, job. You weren't even on the long list, <laughs> <laughs> let alone the short list. So, no, I mean, it, it, it was in the in the uh, newspapers yesterday. Yeah. Is it um, true? Uh, yeah, it is true. There's there's five of us on, on a group that was formed in October, so, um, you know, before these recent games. Um, and uh, it's 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 a great opportunity for me to give, a, to, to give my opinions, my views, perspective on... Couldn't have had a worse year, could they, England? Three managers, yeah. shocking game against yeah. Iceland, really lost the plot towards the end of the Spanish game as well, didn't they? Well, it's we been... needed you at number three. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You should have I mean, brought you... him down and yeah. given a penalty. If you'd seen me play recently <laughs> in Dad's football on a Saturday, you'd have realised that I'm, I'm in no fit state to play. But, no, there's, there's, a, there's, look, there's lots of work that needs to be done, and it's always going to change. The landscape changes, so it's about what we do now yeah. and yeah. what we do medium and long term, and actually trying to give better support, mm. I think... But... Isn't for, this... for a team that can then go on and, and, and be successful. Isn't this just an excuse to eat glassy mints and drink fizzy water? Because we all know Gareth Southgate's got the job. <laughs> don't we? It's, 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 no, we it's, don't. Was it Gary Neville said this is just tick box ex tick Yeah, box but the thing exercise. is, if, if you don't believe in a process, in having a process and just applying... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, an opinion mm. based not on, on getting the reflections of, of a like group the way of people. I didn't deny that. <laughs> no, but, but clearly, I mean, that Gareth's had a denial. fantastic audition, hasn't he? He's, he's, he's had four games. Yes, not bad. Not bad. One, one, two, drawn two, should have beaten Spain. You know, they conceded two very late goals. So actually, you know, he's done a, a, a fantastic job um, so he's got it. In, those four, in those four games. Sounds no, but like there's a process it. that we have to go through. Because, and that process was set up before Gareth was the, was, was the interim manager. The process is... is, 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 is <laughs> exactly. Last few minutes, sparkling water, probably some prawn sandwiches. <laughs> because, nice. you know, they, they, they go hand in hand with football. Were now. you involved in the selection of Mr Allardyce? Uh, I wasn't. I, was, I, was, I had a conversation with, with them about that, but I wasn't directly involved. What does that mean? That you had a conversation? What does that mean? Because the FA went out to a, a broad group of people to oh. ask them about their, uh, about their views yeah. and, and what they said. And actually... You know, having 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 somebody—it doesn't have to be me. 
Having somebody that, that, that has played the game at, mm. at the highest level, been in international dressing rooms, mm. been in club dressing rooms for, well, you know, a, a, a lengthy yeah. period of yeah. time, yeah. I think it's important to get the, that perspective. It doesn't mean my view is, is overriding. Um, the, dis the final decision will be made by the chief executive, the chairman, yes, and, and Dan Ashworth, the technical director. But having input from Players. different parts of yeah. football is really important. And, mm. and it's not just about now. I think it's about now and what goes on in the future, because maybe before... They didn't do that. OK, and lastly, and very briefly, what of Mr Rooney out drinking to the early hours of Sunday morning when his name could have still been on the team sheet for the Spanish game? Well, it, th that's a concern in the sense that it was whilst he was with England. I mean, he's 31 years old, so he's entitled to make his own decisions. And, and if he felt that that was OK to do that, then, then he has to pick up the pieces. He's apologised. I think from, a, from a, an England point of view, I think the concern is that that happened whilst he was with it in England playing, but and, the, and the, in England camp. Yeah. You know, you've got an early morning. Do you, do you have a late night? You know, that sometimes you, you do, sometimes you don't. And, and, well, I think, I think there were questions that have been raised and, and issues that, that we have to speak about in terms of what people do on international duty. What they do in their private life and at the club is down to them and their code of conduct. I think for, for England specifically, and this happened during that get-together, um, you know, there'll be a review of, of procedures and, uh, and, and, and we'll see what comes out of that, what lessons okay. are learned. OK, well, we all know Rooney's all over the papers, so it's a good time to talk about the media. Uh. Don't hate the media. Change the media. Well, that's the motto of a new campaign that's been calling on companies to stop advertising in newspapers that run, and I quote, divisive hate campaigns. This week, it had its first major victory when the toy company Lego pulled all promotional activities from the Daily Mail. It's heartening to see so many people standing up against a newspaper that has vilified judges for just doing their job, demonised refugees, and even attacked desperate children fleeing war. On the other hand, and I know Nick's not going to expect there to be another hand, <laughs> if there's one lesson that can be taken from Trump's election victory, it's that the more you try to shut down illiberal views in the media, the more energy you give them. When it comes to criticising newspapers that peddle divisive and irresponsible journalism, I am at the front of the queue. But the way to do that is to have the argument, not to shut it down. This is a very nuanced uh, debate, I think, because on one hand you've got freedom of the press and are they reporting um, what people are feeling? Are they just a, a reflection of, of, of society? Or are they encouraging and forming people's views and, and fueling that, that debate. Um, in terms of advertising um, and the ethics behind, you know, the stuff we buy, it, it depends how far you go down the line of, of, of checking the provenance of your food, um, the ethical values of the clothes that you buy and where those are sourced from. And, and then, it, then it's down to individual, individual choices. But I think it's... Whilst it's a campaign I'm not particularly against... I just think, hang on, is it a bit of bandwagon jumping in the sense that, you know, if you've got that, if you've got that high, higher sort of value, hmm. should you not have had that years ago? If we're talking specifically about Lego, you know, it was OK until very recently for them to continue advertising with the, the Daily Mail, but suddenly now I should, you know, we, we're well, going to stop I doing that. I would say, that. in defence of the campaign, um, I think that recently lines have been crossed in the press that I don't remember seeing before. I mean, for example, the way that the judges who ruled yeah. in favour of Article 50 were treated, I don't remember seeing anything like that in my lifetime, and I actually never thought I would live to see anything like that in this country. But I think... Well, 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 I think... Well, 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 I think... Well, well, let me finish. <laughs> I think <laughs> that we should all be uncomfortable with the idea of advertisers influencing editorial yeah, positions on newspapers. Yeah. That instinctively, I, I'm not... I'm not comfortable with that. And then the second thing I think to say is that there is a line, right? We have criminal law against incitement to hate. So any publication that crosses that line already faces, faces sanctions. What, the big issue is the grey space, right? Yeah. And I think there's been a lot in the grey space, but I feel that just kind of trying to shut it down is, can, is not going to get rid of the Can I just problem. say something quickly before you come in? Also, advertisers can influence papers for good as well. I mean, if you go back historically, where, where newspapers were far more partisan... I mean, you know, long time ago, mm. partisan, small sort of rags that needed, in order to increase their readership, they needed to get advertising on board. Now, advertising can actually have a benefit, can in encourage um, better reporting, can mm. encourage the debate. It doesn't always necessarily mean the that they're advertising. controlling it for, 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 for lack the, of freedom. As somebody who's been a reporter, I feel really uncomfortable with, about the idea of reporting something with what an advertiser thinks in my mind. I think you need decision. to approach that. You need to approach that with a pure pursuit of truth and balance, not thinking about 
um, commercial That's factors. That's what I went wrong in my career. And before, Nick comes, in, <laughs> yeah. before Nick comes in, there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's one more thing I want to say. I think this is an interesting time, and it's nuanced exactly like you said, for yeah. so many reasons. But one thing, I think, is that actually the right has shown it's instinctively not in favour of freedom of speech all the time. I mean, look at what happened to Gary Lineker. Mm. You know, when Gary Lineker came out yeah. and said uh, what he said about refugees, the treatment by some towards these young refugees is hideously racist. The Sun, what did The Sun do? They oh. called for him to be kicked off the air. I know. I mean, what kind of defence of free speech is that, you know? And I think, actually, this is a time for those of us who genuinely believe in liberal values to show our higher moral ground by saying we don't want to shut down the debate. And actually, yes, there are people with a real sense of grievance. Let's understand it. Not that doesn't mean that we should legitimise racism or, yeah. or xenophobia or misogyny, but, but let's, have let's the at least talk to each other. Yeah. Nick, on which note? Well, what, what's the, what did they do about the judges that upset you so much? Seriously? Oh, yeah, well, what's the matter with it? Do you, do you, do you believe in the separation the judges, of powers? Judge, do you believe that the judiciary should be independent? Judges have an extraordinary position of privilege. If they make rulings that perhaps want to be called into question, we have every right but so why to do. Have been called I'm, into I don't think there's anything wrong with criticising oh. a judgment. So what was I don't they... think there's anything wrong with critically analysing a judgment. So but what, I think where that did they cross the line? personally attacking judges, yeah. putting their photos and their sexual orientation in the paper, that is yeah. vilifying them. Judges are not allowed to respond. And if judges start in the back of their mind to have the law? threat, if if judges start in the back of their mind to have recourse to the threat that if they rule in a certain way, their private lives are going to be pilloried all over the press, that could influence them. And that is the beginning of the end of our democracy. And that's not no exaggeration. Our whole democracy rests on that. So how could you be in favour of Brexit to preserve British sovereignty and then be quite happy to ride yeah. roughshod over the independence British of the judiciary? Judges that's what Britain is about. That's British values. Judges are wholly unaccountable. They're they can, not, they can let people out who then go the off and rape and murder and God knows what else. They get the sentences wrong, they get the verdicts. That's why they, they have, never, that's ever why have to appeal. That's why we have a system, system of though. appeals. Yeah, they change the system. Well, Countless. we've had the system in place for a very long time and we, it's kind of worked. We've gone all over the world. Really? We, and, really? and I remember you defending the Empire on this programme. <laughs> yes, we've gone all over the world spreading this enlightened system of the independent judiciary. It's, it's a core part of what Britishness is. But I think advertisers, to, to echo in some ways your point, advertisers influencing editorial direction is completely wrong because today you've got Lego pulling out because they don't like conversations around the refugees and Brexit. What will you have tomorrow? Will you have a bank pulling out all of the funding because they don't like an investigation that's happening into some of their practices? What, where will it stop? So I'm completely against what they're doing. And I also think if you take the advertising away, because as a business you have an advertising spend, mm. You're putting that, some of it into print media. If you take that away, where are you going to put it? So people will argue, OK, I'm going to put it onto Facebook. Now, one of the things that we've already seen with this election, for example, is the whole like Fair echo, news. yeah, echo yeah. chamber and fake mm -hmm. news and all mm -hmm. the rest of it. So as a business, you need to be really thinking about where am I advertising your brand? And you should be wanting your brand to reach as many different people as you possibly can. And for that reason as well, I think that this campaign is not the right I thing to do. I believe it. I agree with Michelle. Can I just say that Whoa. I do think... I, I, I do <laughs> think that what Gary Lineker has done is really the sort of start of the way things are going. If you look at all the data around millennials, millennials now expect the companies that they support and they buy from to have a social mission, which is why we're seeing the, the rise of fair trade and, and one for one and that model. How many millennials so actually, buy the Daily Mail or the Sun? In all honesty, female, I, female. I, I think you're ascribing too female. much power. No, to I don't know any no, young but woman I'm... who doesn't look at the Kardashians on female. But what I'm example. saying, Nick, is long term. We're not just talking about now. I'm saying if those newspapers want to survive in the future, the mindset of the new generation that are coming through is very different to ours and the older generation. So actually, Gary Lineker may have done them a favour in the long run. Yeah, but ultimately, it's still about it's still about a commercial relationship. So so if an, if if it's if it's in a, a company's um, interest, commercial interest, to advertise on a certain platform, they're going to do that. We've seen it. We've seen it. You know, for, for a long time. Of course, corporate governance well, has I'm got better. What I'm saying is that there's a new generation that will prove that actually it won't be in their commercial but that's what, interest. But that's what yeah, I, but like. then, I would then like to vote with their feet, feet. exactly. Yeah. So I would be thrilled if people stop buying the mail because they're unhappy about some of those headlines. Yeah. But surely it starts but what with I'm products. Uncomfortable, yeah. I'm uncomfortable with it coming from a campaign to target advertising because I think that it's right for papers mm. to respond to their readers, but to mm. respond to, to corporate interests 
like Michelle said, newspaper. I think that could... That the, Mail, could... the Daily Mail well, is a problem. tremendous newspaper that sells very well because it's professionally put together and it knows its reader like that. It's and finally, friendly. let's not forget, no, by the way, that a lot of people it's agree with, with some of the things that they say. But anyway, irrelevant. <laughs> That's how number 10 described mm -hmm. Nigel Farage this week when discussing his potential involvement in fostering a UK-US relationship. Irrelevant, even though he led a party which gained 4 million votes in our last election. Irrelevant, even though he led one of the biggest political changes our country has seen in decades. And you guessed it, <laughs> irrelevant, <laughs> despite him being the first UK politician to have bagged an audience with Donald Trump. To discard him as irrelevant is a huge mistake. In these times of uncertainty and change, we need to use everything we can to help us nav navigate through these choppy waters and to help us develop relationships with the US. Rather than dismissing Nigel Farage, it's time to see him as very relevant <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Theresa May needs to swallow her pride, give Nigel Farage an official role and leverage him in building the next chapter of UK, US, Relations. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're not speechless. <laughs> do you really believe this, Michelle? Of course I do. I wrote that intro myself. <laughs> <laughs> like You've been hanging around with him. For <laughs> um, well, I'm sorry. There are a lot of people in this country who know um, Donald Trump. Piers Morgan's one. So what, should Theresa May ask... Piers Morgan to help broker a relationship. Nigel Farage has no business being involved in conversations between the British government and the American administration. Oh, I'm sorry. It. So Why not? Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, I'm not. Oh, no. there are loads of people then. Oh, I know a couple of people no, that know on, Donald Trump. What? Let me call them sorry, and see if they can I, I help with the conversation. I know you have a real problem with facts, Ms. Sarpong, but can I What's just point out... What's facts got to do with this? Out, I'm looking at He was common... the first non-American to get alongside Donald Trump. Now, the problem with what you're saying is I don't think Mrs May will listen. But this is the unfortunate thing. What's that got to do with anything? Because there's a, there is a kinship, a friendship. They're both kind of self-made men. It's they both kind of appeal to... international diplomacy. Yeah, based on his mates. Mates! I don't recall Michelle saying he should be made foreign secretary. No. All she's saying, from, if I'm right, is that we should be facilitating some kind of dialogue no and using Farage. If I was left to my own devices... Have the same agenda. If I was left to my own devices, by the way, I would actually have him in the House of Lords. Good Just, God, yes, no. I'll make sure you're seated before I suggest that. Can you imagine? But I would, actually. But the reason why is because I believe that the second chamber should be reflective of the way that people have been voting. And, actually, UKIP has only got three people in that chamber, and even then, that was by deflection. It's not by a Appointment. Mm. So for that reason alone, that's why I would well, have him in there. That's separate to this. Can, yeah, of can course. I, yeah, can I just, He's got no can we just wind being back in that conversation? A bit. So, you I can, mean, Graham. What are the qualities needed for, to be a special envoy between the UK and the US? Well, I guess it depends on how you want the role. So I would think of someone like a Prince Andrew, for example. He was a, a trade envoy, and that was based on his contacts and things like that. I look at Nigel Farage. I've got a clip of him, actually. Let me allow him for, to speak for himself for a moment. There's a clip about what his thoughts. Amazing, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine if we were a business and we were looking at Trump and America as somebody that we thought it was very important to form a close relationship with? What, what would you do? You'd find somebody that had connections. I do have connections with Trump, more particularly with Trump's team, many of whom I've known for years, and yet the government don't want in any way to talk to me informally or do anything. And it says a lot, actually, about the way we're governed in this country. We are run by people who've never worked in the real world. You're hired. You know, what that, you, know what that hey. you know what that proves to hey, me? Exactly. I wrote it down before we came on air. Go on. Who does he have at heart? His interests or the UK interests? His interests. And that says everything I need to know about his agenda. And yeah. maybe that's why, and yeah. none of us have pointed out, he has failed to ever be elected <laughs> to the House of Commons. Yeah. <laughs> you'd, think, you'd think if he were that much of a representative voice, he, he would have managed that. He brought but about the biggest political earthquake this country. He did. Thank you. Thank you. Why did him? No, that's there was been done. The sentiment was there already. It wasn't just him. And, and to be fair, he did it. He did it because he hijacked 
you know, because the main parties took on board his campaign. You would never have had a referendum without Nigel Farage. Well, okay. we'll give him yeah. that. Yeah. 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 But that doesn't so mean he's qualified for this yeah. role. He, he has legitimate. no business in this well, it, conversation. Uh, I mean, I, it depends what you want the role to be. Mm. I just want... I don't mean to do nasty if you're watching, uh, Mr Farage. I just want you to be a door opener. That's what I want you to open the mm. door so that Mrs May can come in and sit down and break bread she with Trump. She is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Yeah. She does not need a door opener. But well, that door's going to be open regardless. You're kind of arguing against you. Yeah, who was arguing at the start? I, I, I think that is problematic for the view, our view of the special relationship. I do not think somebody who's mates with his silverback gorilla chum <laughs> just kind of <laughs> sidling in there. I feel so that's about how we conduct international relations. When, I mean, what kind of what kind of idea is that? And also, it's, it's, like, it's like it's like politics somebody. by gangster. But well, you need Nigel Farage is not a gangster. That's a basket of um, you need, there in that picture. You need somebody oh. that understands. <laughs> like, yeah, look at their <laughs> cheesy grins. Is that the uh, pledge reunion? <laughs> <laughs> you need somebody that understands. Um, you know. Am I, gonna, am I seeking to make him the top level of whatever? No. no. What I'm suggesting Michelle. is he understands why we are where we are. Nobody else gets it. I'm telling you now. Yeah. They, they had that... Do you remember we had a debate, a three-hour debate, about whether or not to even ban him? And I understand we had to have that debate, but you were getting Tory yeah. MPs that were calling him bonkers, a wazzock. Yeah. Yeah. You had Michelle, all of this. My... You had an SNP You had an SNP MP who said that even if he was the president, they would still ban him. People don't get him. Yeah, yeah. They don't understand yeah, him. Yeah. He does. Yeah. And if you don't... Listen, if you don't use him in some way, more fool you, no, quite Michelle, frankly. When, yeah, yeah. when Barack Obama became president of the United States, we didn't need an intro into him. It was well, that done wasn't through a the official change. Yes, though, was it? it was. He was the first black president you, of the United States. What's a bigger change you, than that? You two have been <laughs> saying that this is such a massive, monumental change. Yeah. We need mm. this crisis meeting because it's such a change. So then I'm saying to you, but you let the prime minister but, and the president uh, and the foreign uh, uh, secretaries June, deal with that, not vital, some random June, bloke. June, He's not a random bloke. June, you're missing a vital point. Um, Mr. Obama was a politician. So he, he kind of knew his craft. Donald Trump has never been a politician in his life. Nigel Farage mm. actually started in Stockbroker. Mm. So they but have what such... Has that got well, you, to do you, 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 you challenged Michelle about Obama. We didn't need it for Obama. No, because Obama was a politician. Need it but Trump anyone. needs friends now. Because he's, he's need... one... I, I, perhaps even he's surprised that he got there. Surely you need somebody who's going to actually represent the views of the government. Yeah, and and Nigel, Nigel Farage represents, represents his own views. Yeah. I don't ahead think of... anyone's listened to Michelle. Yeah. She's not I saying don't want him to prime... be Deputy but Prime Minister in... or anything, no. by the way. If That's it's in his ear, by default, yeah. conversations that they have will be along the lines once of... Right. of but once you put someone like Farage in some nebulous, undefined position of yeah. influence, the problem is, like, what are the boundaries? How do you then determine... How do you make sure he's just a door opener? And you can't control Nigel Farage. Who does he represent and what would his role be? And I just don't think that it's compatible with the kind of accountability and checks and balances of I relations it, between countries to just times. dump him in there. I've said it many times and I'll say it again. The reason that we're in this situation is because people do not understand. And then they wake up the next day when someone like a Brexit's happened or a Trump's been appointed. They wake up and they are so shocked. They don't know what to do. They don't talk for days on end because they're so shocked. You, you need people that understand what is going on. Nigel Farage has been fundamental to this. You might think it's irritating. You might disagree well, with yeah, everything he says. I want to know what his skills says. are. I mean, if he's a mascot or literally a door okay. opener, mascot. Then, <laughs> then, then, then we've got to see if he's qualified <laughs> for that. Can any of you name our ambassador in Washington? No, no. I can. It's a Kim Darren. Yeah, I can. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm not, nothing against him. I'm sure he's a wonderful... Donald Trump won't know who he is. No. Wouldn't have a clue. He could be selling the big issue. So, therefore, any role that Farage had would be pointless. Did you see that picture of him? Did you see that picture of him with Obama, I think it was, of, of Sir Kim? I'm sure it was him with Obama, their first picture. I'm sure right. I've got this in my head right. It was really awkward and, like, for me, I can't stress it enough. No, this Even is... if you disagree with Nigel Farage's politics, and I get that you do, I can feel that coming in my No, that's got nothing to do with anything. I'm just saying he he is not relevant to this conversation. I can't I wait to see. I can't wait I to see a photo relevant. of them having an arm wrestle. <laughs> anyway, an arm wrestle. Arm wrestle. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. okay. <laughs> I'm up next, and I'll be telling you why I think Trump won't be the first American president who doesn't last the distance. show of Trump the president won't last long. Having just returned from the States, I still stand by what I said before his victory. I believe America is in the process of a seismic shift, demographically and culturally. I compare what just happened to Nixon's silent majority victory in 1968. 
But in the end, Nixon's second term ended in disaster, and the progressive attitudes of the protesting baby boomers won the day. Trump's campaign was so riddled with scandal, I'd be amazed if he actually manages to last four years without being forced to stand down. I see Trump as a blip and, in fact, an aid towards a more progressive union. He is not the answer, and his followers will realise pretty quickly. Hola. Right. <laughs> Trump's, Trump's, cam uh, uh, Trump's campaign was riddled with scandal, Ms. Sarpong. Whoops, Clinton's. Are you kidding me? No. I just so we're talking one email. 650,000 emails, I'm, actually. I'm talking about the emails in general. Right. And then. Uh, an, Where do I an begin? FBI inquiry, Where do I begin with Trump? An FBI inquiry which was just stopped just ahead of the election time. Because there was nothing there. An FBI inquiry which was really to scupper you, her campaign. You think they read 650,000 emails in two and, and a half technology days? That enabled come you, off there's it. technology that enables you to do that in a couple of hours. Let's come back to your broader point. Okay. What, what do you suggest? So he will. What, he'll give up or something? You say no, no, he won't... no, 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 no. My broader point is, um, as you know, I've just been in America. Yeah, which bit were you in? Houston. Oh, right. Um, and Houston's a really interesting city. Houston is the um, uh, most ethnically diverse city in America. And they see it as a microcosm of what America is going to be. So what Houston is today, America will be okay, in 20 years from now. Um, and all of the things that you see happening with a Trump kind of happened in Houston 20, 25 years ago. And so the way that the um, sociologists in Houston look at this is this is actually growing pains. And it's, a, and it's two things happening here. It's a country changing, and it's changing in a way that cannot be turned back. You, he can try and deport 11 million undocumented workers or whatever. Only it's the criminals, he said, now. He's refined. Yeah, now it's 3 million yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's baked in. Number one, those 11 million undocumented workers hold up the US economy. Right. And as it's only the criminals, I say, for the second time. <laughs> okay, I don't know what right. you don't understand about that. Okay, <laughs> okay. And, and secondly, um, you have people who are now two, three generations in. So, but by 2040, it's what I'm like saying. It's like a memorial is, lecture. No, so All I asked was, what's going to happen to him? Is he going to give up? You said he's not going to get to full I, term. What I'm saying is, I think two things are going to happen. One, Trump has always, always been on the edge of, of, of illegal behaviour. He's someone that just always mm. pushes things. And he's been able to get away with it as a billionaire businessman. It's a very different ball game as President of the United States. Can I just... So I have... Let me finish. Sorry. So I have no doubt that he's bound to do something dodgy. So you don't he's end up in prison? I'm not saying he's going to end up in prison. I'm saying I don't know if he's going to so, last but, but, because he's not going to be able to help yeah. himself. But the other thing I'm saying is, in terms of his policies, right. they are not going to do anything for the That's people who voted for him. And I think they're going to be pretty disappointed. What is unsustainable, Joe? What, what is unsustainable? Sustainable, the politics, or the person? Both. 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 And what I'm so, saying so, is, this so, is okay. a blip. My second question is: If you look is, at the way America yeah. is changing, these sorts of extreme right yeah. views are okay. not sustainable long term. So my term. second question is: Why then did you say that it was right that the EU should have had a, an emergency meeting in the sense that if it's a blip? Uh, why, why is there a whole movement uh, of, of concern about the impact well, that has on, let me on Europe and the individual countries George that? Bush was a blip, but it was a dangerous blip. Eight years isn't a blip. Well, whatever, it was still dangerous. And what I'm saying is four years of Trump is still dangerous. So, of course, the EU should hold an emergency oh, meeting. Okay. But what I mean is the long me. term for America... This kind of extreme right will not last, just, just because of the thing. way the country oh. is changing. We just need to make one thing. President-elect Trump has never been convicted of anything. He is facing charges. We just need to make that absolutely he's never... He's never been, been convicted. So, okay. I just don't know how... I don't understand why people are going to be so quick to predict that this is all going to be absolutely carnage, because... None of us actually know. You're talking about his policies. We don't even fully understand well, what his policies are gone going to be. Five no, but or hold six on. times, no, I but, would be quite concerned about this, running a country's economy. You call this um, a blip, and I was watching um, an interview with some, I think it was West Virginian uh, coal miners. Yeah. They've like uh, these are like absolutely desperate, yeah. desperate people who life has really not been kind to recently in terms of losing but their jobs and sure, stuff. A... No, hold on, let me finish. So you dismiss it and you go, oh, it's a blip, it's no, carnage, I don't it's a car it. crash, it's this and that.
to those people. This is what they want. This is what they're pinning hopes on. And you know what? Some of the things and I really why, hope he follows through with in terms of jobs. That's why this breaks and... my heart because this man is not going to provide for those people. Well, we don't know all. what's going to happen he yet. How do you know? He doesn't care a Neither second. Michelle, that's for what those I think. People. You know, when June's saying his policy, awful. Means, and I agree with June. I think that um, it's not, we don't know the detail of his policies, but we know the promises that he's made. Yeah. And it is tragic because people are suffering. You know, the middle class is declining. People have seen their real income fall. There's no work. That's eight years of it's, Obama it's, for it's you. Serious. No, it's 35 you know, it's not years of globalisation. No, it's 35 years of globalisation. It's the complete decline of manufacturing. Yeah. Now, Trump is promising these people something different, but he doesn't have any answers. And we all know that that's not something you can solve in four or eight years. And that's why I agree with June that people are going to be disappointed. And I agree as well that America is changing. I mean, you just look at the map of young voters, where yeah. young voters did not vote for <laughs> Trump. It's yeah. completely blue map yeah. when you look at the young vote. But the only thing I would say though, to qualify it is that the, the alt-right does have a young edge to its movement, you know, and, and th that's what I think is one of the new things about this mm. is that you're seeing a movement that is far right that has managed to tap in to a generation of millennials i don't think they're a in the majority certain, yeah. but you can't ignore them because they're there and they're significant and they're more and more organized and than ever also I the thing either. also the yeah. thing is though what, what you're saying there afro is that it might not be a blip then if people are that desperate that they feel that trump's his rhetoric or his what he was saying as, a, as a, no. when he was campaigning was something that that you know they would invest their time in they wanted such change surely they're going to want that change for a, period, a set so period of time. No, it's not going to... It doesn't necessarily no, mean it's a blip. No, but, Graham, I think there are two things here. There's, there's the point that Michelle made, which is completely valid, that, you know, the, particularly in the rural communities of America, they have completely been forgotten and exploited and, and really come off worse in terms of globalisation. And, actually, it's, it's shocking it took them... 35 years to revolt in terms of how badly they've been treated. You know, 90% of the wealth creation is in, what, 20%, 5% of the top 1% of the country's um, hands. But what I'm saying is, long-term, back to Afwa's point, the policies, if you can even call them that, that Donald Trump is proposing will not provide jobs for these well, people. Mean, because roads and because, aqueducts and airports that, but, and bridges. But that's if that's only, not going to no, get that's saying, short, that's 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 only short term. term. Well, there's a lot because, of roads. It's because, a good country. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we've been reduced because, to here. That because, is the problem. It's because, it's it's like it or not, <laughs> coal is on the decline. It's gone. Yeah, it's, but that's across the world. No, that's my point. So what you need for those people is you need new training for the new jobs of the future. You need to make sure we upskill that part of America, and actually, it's going to be the renewal industries. Well, he doesn't believe in climate man. change, for yeah, starters. He, oh, he, he doesn't <laughs> believe in climate change, and it's but the renewable sector that's going to have all the jobs. Time will tell, June, whether it's a blip or not. Anyway, after the break, I'll be telling you how playing the game could save the NHS. Another day, another headline screaming about the secret plan to axe hospitals. We all know the NHS needs money and radical reform, and that the people that use it, us, must take responsibility for the health issues that we can prevent. We've tried scaring people into losing weight and taxing alcohol and cigarettes. It's not enough, and it ignores a basic bit of human psychology. If you reward people for good behaviour, they keep doing it. Incentives work for school children, for employees, for customers encouraged to get loyalty cards from shops. The whole gaming sector is built on people's desire to win points, break records and get to the next level. Mm -hmm. We need to gamify the NHS in the same way. My plan would be to give a health check to the nation, then set people individual health targets. Give up smoking by April, 10 points. <laughs> Lose a stone in a year, 6 points. <laughs> Once you reach a set number of points, you get a tax break. It's a rewards-based system. It's simple, and it could help save the NHS. <laughs> so, Graham, <laughs> I, um, I've said many times on this show before, <clears throat> haven't I, how I get so infuriated when people do not take personal responsibility for their own good health. You know, 40% of Brits, apparently, are going to be obese by 2025. Mm. I think that's outrageous. There was, a, like, a, a trial, if you like, of this. There was a game last year 
which was um, it was gamification, but it was it was uh, not just technology. It was a physical game in partnership with the um, NHS and also with Disney, where parents could send off get these packs like Disney related packs and all the rest of it. You got these cards that would give you a physical challenge to do. Every time the the kid did the challenge, they got the sticker. You stuck it on this poster. It worked. It got the kids active. And I think when we're looking at statistics such as those obesity ones going through the roof, we have to do something. So I'm with you on that. I think how we'd implement it and what that would actually look like, I'd want to probe you a bit more on that. But in principle, do it. I think it's a good idea in the sense that I like the idea of incentivizing people instead of mm. punishing people mm. you know I think that's positive and I agree that we need to do something about the NHS <laughs> Nick's face is brilliant by the way I can't, <laughs> I can't wait, wait to hear what you that. <laughs> but and I know he's gonna love this my only worry is that in a way the language of rewarding people mm. is also about punishing people who don't manage to do things so for example if you get a tax break if you're successful it means that the people who aren't successful basically end up paying more tax and I think you know and I've made this point before but I really th th feel like it's important mm. look at the root causes of why people struggle with obesity and health you know sedentary lifestyle yeah. low incomes fast food and additive riddle food being mm. much cheaper, smoking yeah. is you know, yeah. often related to stress. The reason why people have these lifestyle problems is often deep-seated, you know, and people who have suffered abuse or have difficult lives often yeah. are much more likely to have these problems. So I would be worried about something which rewards people who perhaps actually are the ones who need but, less help. But what we do already, we, we live in a punitive environment yeah, where people have to pay more mm. so the sugar tax for instance it yeah. basically means is that going to change people's habits or is it just going to make people pay more for the habits that they've got so however we look at it there are winners and losers unfortunately now of course I'm not sort of saying that, that the people with the with the most difficult situations shouldn't have all the support that they want but if we're able to sort of implement a change of of culture over a period of time, of course, and Nick's going to say this is a wonderful idea on a piece of paper, but in practice it's never going to work. It's, it's worse than that. Oh, it's worse than that, Dan. I was going for option B, the soft option. He, he really likes me, option. Um, but the fact is that there's a huge group of people that do change their lifestyles for the benefit of everyone and for the NHS. So if we can encourage people to do that, then that frees up spaces and opportunities for people that really need it. Um, and... I don't think we've got anything to lose. Obviously, you've got to work out the costs, the way you set up mm. people um, having health checks to measure them. But ultimately, people like rewards. Please Nick bring gets, Nick, Nick in. gets a biscuit. He gets a biscuit Which every time he does something biscuits, at home, <laughs> don't you? Every time you do a bit of DIY, yeah, yeah, you get a biscuit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. he's, he's doing right. a lot of DIY at the moment. <laughs> Graham, <laughs> Graham, your arguments are much the way you used to play football. Average. Uh, very well-meaning, but ultimately fruitless. <laughs> Uh, I like the idea of ta tax breaks, right, yeah. if you lose weight. I mean, presumably they'll owe me money. They will, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But don't you realise a lot of the NHS funding mm. is going to lard ass layabouts who are sitting on their sofa and living on benefits? So how are you possibly <laughs> going to get to them? It won't make a blind bit of difference to them because they don't even pay any tax because they're too lazy to go to work. And because they're too lazy to go, they get fat, which means they have to go down to the doctors, which means yeah. they have to give them surgery, yeah. and then they smoke all the time, this? and then they get heart disease, and God knows what else. Saying, so it won't do anything. Yeah. That's a huge that the crisis in obesity is because of basically benefits cheats who sit at home on their sofa. Not wholly, but there's a fair <laughs> chunk of it. Yeah, there's a fair chunk. <laughs> but go to any town centre in Britain, you'll see great ass, lard asses pushing trolleys around, strollers around. Where's your statistics on that, please? I don't need to see them. I get it. I am out and about with people all day long. I'm not going to rise to the bait. Do you know I The Ferrari bait. But ultimately, you can't motivate if everyone. If I'm on benefits, I don't Look. give a damn about my tax. I don't even file a tax well, return. Well, then you could cut benefits. Then. But if you were to get, if you were to get, if you were to get cash in hand for for, for signing up to this and, and achieving something. Would that motivate some of those people? he's going to people? spend it on his more cigarettes or more beer and he's making himself ill again. Yeah, but then he goes backwards or she goes backwards. Can I and, ask and a question? Go on. I don't... So, I, I love the idea of it, but no. what about for people who don't really use the NHS and do the right thing, you know, maybe people like us, how often do you go to a doctor or whatever, then what are the incentives for us? Because we're not getting anything. No, but you could still, you could still sign up to the plan. If we, if we take this, if, you know, you'd obviously have to do pilots and, and hmm. look at the unintended consequences or who misses out. Yeah. But, but if, you, if you said this was successful and everybody signed up to it, then, of course, everybody can benefit. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to stop having a healthy lifestyle, right. but actually getting rewarded for not being a burden on the, on the yeah. NHS, I think we should get rewarded for. Because if you've got a percentage of your... All of our tax, there's a percentage of that 
that goes to the NHS. Yeah. We don't know what it is because mm. they don't they don't Ter show us. Terrorism. But if we say 20% of the tax that we pay goes to the NHS, but if I can prove over a period of time I'm 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 not taking anything out of that twenty yes. percent. Then, you should be able then to get why shouldn't people back. get, like get the opportunity to, really? to, to have I some think money back? June is on to something with what she said because I think that actually this is all based on a bit of a negative view of human nature. I think people want to be fit. You know, people who have healthy lifestyles aren't doing it for reward. They do it because they feel good. And yeah. most people who have unhealthy lifestyles, if you talk to them, do they don't they feel, feel good and they yeah. would like to be healthier. Yeah. And they would like some more support to be healthier. So I feel like I'm not against what you're saying, but we haven't exhausted the possibility of actually encouraging and supporting Just people. Just eat less and but run more. Yeah, but Pete, that's not working, Nick. Everyone knows the health benefits, but it's not working. And, and it's not just about just presuming that people that aren't able to change. They are able to change, but they work. need the right motivation. I mean, you used to get up at 11 o'clock in the morning, but now you're motivated to get up earlier because you've got a radio show. <laughs> 14 years, I haven't been up at 11. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think the eyes look like Post-truth, Nick, post-truth. 14 years, I've been getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Well, I agree with you anyway. And, by the way, a reward doesn't just have to be cash. You can do various different things. Yeah. And my point is, because I'm with you, Nick, personal mm. responsibility, I've said it... Mm. hundreds of times but it has to be when that's not working you have to try something new and I'm absolutely in favor of things like gamification and things like that I think it could work well I think it's time to try something new yeah the writer of back to the future has revealed that the film's villain Biff Tannen was based on Donald Trump yes both are successful businessmen who get into politics but president-elect Trump has a different message to Biff he promises he'll bring America together and that it's all about love. The power of love is a curious thing. Make it one and weak, make it another bad thing. Change your talk to a little white dove. More than a feeling, that's the power of love. Don't take money, don't take fame. Don't need no better car to ride this train. It's strong and it's sunny. It's cruel sometimes, but it might just save your life. That's the power of love. That's the power of love. Oh. So, a lot of love from Donald Trump, do you think, going forwards? It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel the love? I'm speechless right now <laughs> for a number of reasons. <laughs> give him a chance. That's what that's I would say. That's all you are saying is yeah. give him a chance. That's yeah. Well, that's it from us for this week. Let us know who you think won their debate and who got it all wrong by heading to our Twitter and Facebook pages. See you next time. <laughs>